Hello. Welcome to Postcolonial Space. I'm Masood Raja. I hope you all are doing well. In today's conversation, I would like to talk about just one postmodernist concept discussed by Linda Hutchin in her book, The Politics of Postmodernism. And the concept is de-doxification. Now, in order to understand this concept, and I'll go to the specific place in the book where she discusses it, please also keep in mind that you have to know a little bit about Roland Barthes' concept of a healthy sign. So in one of his works, and if I, I can find a reference to it, I'll post it in the description, Barthes discusses the healthy sign versus the terroristic sign. A terroristic sign for Barth is a sign that represents itself as containing all the meanings of a referent as being uncontested and as con concluding and including all meaning. A healthy sign is a sign that points to its own provisionality, which acknowledges that it is a sign constructed by words and part of a representational process. So anytime someone tries to push a terroristic sign, what they are also insisting upon that it can only mean what it means and nothing else can be added to it. So pretty much all religious doxa, right, all religious imperatives offer themselves as this absolutely stable sign with no permutations or, rem or different meanings or their possibilities. And that is what Barth would call a terroristic sign. So de-doxification then, obviously if you look at how the world is constructed, doxa, right, and de, de-doxification is when we attempt to undo the doxological aspects of any sign, any sign offering itself to be absolutely true and a true representation of the real or the referent. So keep that in mind, and then let's go to where she uses the term, and she uses it within the context of representation while drawing a distinction between the realistic mode of representation and modernist mode of representation, and how does postmodernism enter that fray, and that's where detoxification becomes important to understand. Okay, so before I go to the exact quote, I forgot to mention that this conversation was requested by one of the subscribers who had watched my uh, lectures on Linda Hutchins' A Poetics of Postmodernism, and she had requested that I should try to explain the concept of detoxification. So on page 34 of The Politics of Postmodernism, Linda Hutchian is discussing the question of representation and how Frederick Jameson discusses it and others discusses, discuss it. But she's particularly interested in the realistic representation and its claims, what does it claim to be, and then the modernist question of representation. So, in fact, many postmodern strategies are openly premised on a challenge to the realist notion of representation that pre presumes the transparency of the medium and thus the direct and natural link between sign and referent or between word and world. Of course, modernist art, in all its forms, challenged this notion as well, but it deliberately did so to the detriment of the referent. That is, by emphasizing the opacity of the medium and the self-sufficiency of the signifying system. What postmodernism does is to denaturalize both realism's transparency and modernism's reflexive response while retaining in its typically complicitously critical way 
the historically attested power of both. This is the ambivalent politics of postmodern representation. With the problematizing and de-doxifying of both realist reference and modernist autonomy, postmodern representation opens up other possible relations between art and the world. So I'm going to end it here. Let us unpack. What she's trying to discuss then is that in realist art, let's say the novel or writing, what is taken for granted or is offered as a natural sign is that realist art represents whatever is there in the world, the referent, transparently through the medium of written word. Right? So a realistic novel famously is supposed to be how things are in reality. That's the claim of realism. Modernism, on the other hand, high modernist art, plays with the concept of the real and tells us, you know, you can't access the real through my novel, through my text, because what is important is to see how brilliantly I have represented it, how brilliantly I have mapped someone's consciousness, how brilliantly have I transfigured something that exists in reality and through a work of art. So there is a claim to the beauty of the artifact itself. And, and the question isn't that I need to get to the real through the artifact. What I'm trying to read in a modern novel is what the novel itself is doing, right? So referent, the word, falls by the wayside, right? These are the two distinctions between realism and postmodernism, both offering their mode of representation as natural, right? Also as doxological. So how does the postmodern de-doxify that is when it comes face to face with realism and, and postmodernism, it retains some of realism, some of post of some of modernism without repudiating them. But it makes their claims to representation problematic. Right? And by doing so, it points to the provisionality or the constructedness of the sign in modernism and realism itself. It tells us, well, that kind of a claim to representation is untenable, but here in a parodic form, I'm going to try to do that anyway. Right? This is a novel. Read it. It will tell you about the world, that kind of self-reflexivity. And similarly, the abstract the non-representation claims of modernism are also kind of destabilized by sometimes offering within a novel which might have modernistic techniques employed, inserting something that, it, that comes from the realistic tradition. What could be some of the good examples? Now, if you look at the 19th century British novel, the realistic or the metafictional part of it used to be that as you're reading a story, and if the author wants to give you a spatial or temporal jump, or if he or she wants to shift the scene, they will insert a sentence or two there where they will address the reader directly. Dear reader, while this is happening at Mr. X's house, so-and-so has now reached over there. Let us see what he or she is doing. So that authorial voice then was in a realistic novel where we were shifting from one realistic representation to another. A postmodern, a modernist novel usually will not do that. It would be a big no-no, right? So if you read James Joyce, if you read Virginia Woolf or Faulkner, if you are jumping from one consciousness to, to another, most of the times you have to figure out yourself as to in whose consciousness you are. I mean, the famous example, of course, would be uh, Sound and the Fury, right? Sometimes you are in Benjay's mind. Sometimes you are in Quentin's mind. Sometimes you are in Jason's mind, right? And you know in whose mind you are because you have become privy to how thoughts are represented and you are not necessarily privy to how a real person called Benjay in the world performs and behaves. It's because you have learned the logic of the text itself. 
a post-modern novel would sometimes point to it. Hey, you were in Benjay's mind five minutes ago. Let's now go and see what Jason is doing. It is playing with the 19th century trope, but in the process of doing that, it is dismantling the modernist claim to the work of art containing the whole representation and inserting within it a realistic trope. And same happens when an extremely modernist novel is being written, but somewhere in there you see a realistic representation. Uh, for example, um, the novel about Dresden, right? Um, Slaughterhouse 4, right? or Slaughterhouse 5. Um, it starts with, I have always wanted to write a novel about Dresden, and you are thinking you are in the preface of the novel. But as you read, you realize that you have been in the novel from the very start, right? And, and the novel starts with a realistic expectation, right? But as you read more and more and more, you realize that it has certain modernistic tendencies too. So these are some of my examples. Uh, I don't think so. I've done a good job of explaining it. But just keep in mind that her term, dedoxification, is informed by Barth's concept of the terroristic sign and healthy sign. And it is a challenge to any form of naturalization. Whenever a sign system or a genre represents itself as natural and not constructed and is accepted as such, unsettling that, dismantling that claim, pronounced or silent, right? is an act of denaturalizing the sign. What you're pointing to is that the sign is stable or offers itself as true because it is made so by the artist or by the work of art or by the conventions. And when you do that, especially in terms of different periods of writings, different schools of writing, then you are also de-doxifying the claims of that movement, right? So it, it's, it's, it's doxa, it's uncontested claims or assumptions are not revised and repudiated, but made fluid. And that's what postmodernism, if you've watched my other lectures, always does. Instead of giving its own overarching episteme, it plays with modernism and others parodies it or, or makes a pastiche out of it, plays with it, never really completely overwrites it, but takes it to different directions. So conclude, to conclude, Linda Hutchins' concept, dedoxification, is offered in her discussion of postmodern representation, within which she is comparing the realistic claims to representation and modernistic claims to representation. In one, the referent is supposed to be offered to us through an act of representation, if so facto as it is. In the other, the referent falls by the wayside, and what we are supposed to more focus on is how it has been crafted into a work of art. And what she's saying is that when postmodernists interact with the two, they destabilize both these claims. And that act of doing that is detoxification of those claims. That's all. I hope it was useful. I strongly urge you to read the book, both her books, and then see where they take you. Thank you so much for your time. And as always, peace and love.